Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the 92Y Tribeca here in New York City. Thomas Dolby is not only an innovator, an entrepreneur, and also a musical genius, but he's also a man that never took himself seriously. In fact, in 1983, She Blinded Me With Science took to the airwaves here in the United States on what was an infant video channel called MTV. Now, he's here in the United States promoting a brand new record, his first in 20 years. And tonight we're going to sit down and talk about his meteoric rise as one of the innovators of what you would call synth pop, new wave. Going to sit down and talk about him playing with the likes of Foreigner, Def Leppard, to co writing a song with the legendary hip hop group Houdini, to him starting Beatnik Incorporated, which has produced ringtones to the tune of 3 billion people all over the world. This guy has been a dynamic entrepreneur behind the scenes. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Thomas Dolby here in New York City at the 92Y Tribeca. I was drifting for days Let the sun go to shine Now the night is young I might clock a little over time first record you recorded in 20 years and it's not like you haven't been busy but why did you decide to come out of semi-retirement? I wasn't really retired I went to Silicon Valley in about 1992 uh, because I wanted to get involved in tech stuff and the music business was boring me and I was ready for a break for a change of scenery and I thought I'd go there for a couple of years sabbatical and two years turned into like 16 and um I formed a company which sort of did so-so for many years and then finally did well. By the time it did well, I was completely bored, silly with it. And I really wanted to get back to music. And I was feeling bad that I'd been away for so long because it's my first love. Um, but uh, so I retired from my company and moved my family back to England. And then I just set up to start writing and recording a new album. And uh, the result is A Map of the Floating City. Now... This, I understand, is the first of three additional products or releases that you're going to, I guess, allow your fans to download for free. Not exactly. It's kind of the sum of three different products. Uh, the album has uh, three distinct parts to it, named after three imaginary continents. They're called Americana with a K, Urbanoia, and Oceania. And uh, Americana was, you know, I lived in the USA for 23 years and really enjoyed it. And I had a, have good memories of living here. And while I was here, I got quite fond of American roots music. 
And uh, people think us Brits are very original, you know, but in fact, we're not original at all. We're just very good at pilfering styles from elsewhere in the world. And then we just, we, we mash them up and put a gloss on them and re-export them to you guys, you know. Uh, going back to Delta Blues and, you know, um, reggae and uh, house music. I mean, we're just very good at picking a style that's ready to explode and, uh, you know, just tweaking it a little. Uh, but, you know, American folk, jazz, country, bluegrass, blues music is is uh, is really, is truly original. And I appreciate that about it. And although in some ways I have no rights to be dabbling in it myself, um, I do it with a sort of ironic twist. Um, so, for example, I got a song that's a sort of a, a bluegrass techno uh, hybrid called Toad Lickers. And it's about some guys that, you know, like live up in the hills and lick toads, but they're not, they're not in like Virginia or somewhere. They're in, in South Wales, um, which if you've ever been there, you know, to call them mountains is kind of a joke. You know, I think that part of this project is, too, you have some very unique and very different special guests on here, Mark Knopfler. Um, you, you've decided that you're going to put more of an emphasis on the writing. The songs I hear are very original. Yeah, I mean, uh, as I get older, I realize that, you know, there's a proliferation of uh, instrumental music out there. There's a lot of groove music with vocals that are sort of um, sampled and, se and sequenced in. Um, more of an impressionistic approach, you know, to music. Uh, less of a narrative, no story behind them, and often not a sort of, a, you know, a literary voice. Like, like there's no sense of a narrator um, telling a story. And uh, I miss that. And I think that's something I always did well. Uh, so although people tended, to, you know, in the old days to focus on the sounds, the production and so on, I'm making them less upfront this time. And it's partly because I want, I want to focus on the songs. And it's partly because I, you know, I, I yield that seat to young guys that have got hours to twiddle knobs and so on. And, and you know, life's too short to be doing that for me at this point. In dreams the skies are as you blow The sea's a mirror pond Then you wake to howling wind and rain Upon your roof tiles It won't be long It won't be very interesting life from beginning to end your father is or was a college professor and you grew up in academia but how did the music bug hit you you know i used to when i was at boarding school i used to hide under the bedclothes at night with an earphone and a transistor radio listening to radio caroline which is a, a pirate radio station uh, on a ship moored off the coast of england and in fact uh, were that ship still afloat i'd be able to see her from the periscope on my lifeboat in my garden, which is where my studio is, uh, because it was right out there in the North Sea. And um, that was really how I got started. It was against the grain, you know, because my whole family were pretty much academic. You know, there's other, other college professors in my family and uh, a lot of teachers and so on. And we knew almost nobody in showbiz at all. You know, it was like a six degrees away from anybody in showbiz. And so it was really quite surprising when I, I went you know, that route. Um, but I think my parents kind of liked it. You know, I was from, they had six kids. I was the youngest. Many of them followed in the academic footsteps. And by the time it got to me, they thought it was kind of amusing that I went off to be a pop star. That's pirate radio. Pretty much a lot of artists uh, were broken through through pirate radio. I mean, Incognito, um, Loose Ends. There are a lot of groups that have come out of pirate radio, which because... BBC Radio didn't play a lot of 
black music or American roots music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, they played Motown, um, but they had, you know, I think like most radio stations of the era, they had a, a, a set idea of what kind of formats they would play. But unlike the U.S., where you could always change the dial, you know, over to a station that was that was playing black music, was playing other styles of music, country, whatever, jazz music. In in the U.K., we only had the BBC pretty much, and the licensing laws are very tight, which is why Caroline and Luxembourg and so on were these pirate stations that were outside of the, you know, the the British Isles per se, but were broadcasting to the British Isles, and they were able to play all sorts of stuff, and so that was our only access really to to different styles of music. What was it about the keyboards and the piano that this is what you were going to do? I mean, I'm looking at your career and just all the records you put out. I mean, there's jazz, there's soul, there's world music. You cover everything. Mm. Yeah, I actually started on guitar aged about 10. And I was strumming on a guitar sort of doing, you know, Dylan, Joan Baez songs uh, before I ever got into keyboards. And I was sort of attracted to the keyboard largely because I liked uh, instrumental piano music, whether it be, you know, Schubert impromptus, whether it be Oscar Peterson or Dave Brubeck or Thelonious Monk, you know, a handful of, of jazz guys that I really liked. And um, so I was just I was just drawn to it. And, um, you know, when electronics first became feasible, um, because they, you know, when I started out, they were out of my reach. You know, it's like just very he big, heavy machines that are very expensive and didn't do very much. And um, you'd have to have to go to a professional recording studio or a university music department or something like that to get your hands on one. But it, gradually, over the course of the '70s, they became a bit more accessible. You got the Mini Moog and so on. And um, and then at the same time, we started to get exposed to um, you know pure electronic music uh, from Germany, largely you know Tangerine Dream, Purple Vu, uh, Henry Cow, and uh, Kraftwerk, and people like that. And then um, I think the big turning point came when um, uh, David Bowie, who had been a big rock and roll star, you know, to most of my generation, very iconic in the Ziggy Stardust era. Um, you know, went did a complete about face and went to Berlin with Eno and, uh, you know, recorded Low, which is one of the best electronic albums ever. You know, not only because it had pure electronic pop songs on it on, on side A, but because side B was the first time we'd heard, you know, ambient electronic music in the mainstream. And it was just absolutely mind blowing to, to, to me. And, um, you know, this was parallel to punk going on so punk was you know lots of energy great fashion lots of social you know rebellion about it but musically it you know it was sort of limited it was like mostly three chords and that's fine and everything but it didn't really appeal to me it didn't stimulate me musically that's sort of why i went in the other direction towards the the more electronic sound isn't that strange because bowie after that went with a guy by the name of Nile rogers and went in a whole nother r&b vein i mean that's Boy was something else. Well, he was amazing I mean, because, in fact, before well, before he went to to Berlin with Eno, you know, he'd done the Young Americans, uh, which was you know his first sort of brush with that stuff. But then, you know, in the middle of the eighties with, with Modern Love and stuff, you know, he got back to Let's Dance. He got back to that that sound again, uh, but with a, a more of a sort of eighties gloss on it. You know? I was fourteen, she was twelve, father traveled. Hers as well, you roll by. generation of a new form of entertainment called music television mtv and it kind of put the visual to a whole nother level you michael jackson prince even bowie i mean there's so many i can name kind of 
catapulted your careers to a whole nother level. How did you embrace that at the time? Because it was very much an infant when you came out with uh, Europa and your first record. Mm. Well, you know, I mean, it was, um, it, it felt like it was just a handful of us that were pioneering that stuff. Now, part of this was because it was very hard going, you know, it's like to do stuff with electronics was difficult in those days. You know, it wasn't easy like it's become now. Um, and you couldn't record any of it really unless you got into a professional recording studio and they were expensive. So you had to find somebody stupid enough to loan you some money and that was called a record label, you know. And you could have a lot of talent and not even get a tape to an A&R guy, you know, to get considered for a record deal. So it was this huge barrier to entry, you know, to get into that stuff. And that's why only a handful of us really got our hands on the equipment and got to mess with it, like the first Fairlights in the country, you know, the first sampling that came along, first polyphonic synthesizers and sequencing, and, and um, you know, the first early Macs that, that, you know, had software on them and things. It was all, it was all really at arm's length for a lot of people. Because I wanted to, that was, you, you, you nailed it. I, I wanted to ask you, you were one of the few artists also when analog was just getting ready to go out, a new form of, called digital was coming in. How did you adjust to that, too? Because it's a different type of format. And then, two, the technology had to change with it, too. All your keyboards. I mean, I know it had to be mind-boggling for you. Well, it was certainly mind-boggling. But, I mean, if you're referring to tape, you know, analog tape versus digital tape, um, it's astonishing now to think of, you know, the, the restrictions that we had in those days because you had limited numbers of tracks, so you had to make decisions as you went along. I mean, often you'd have an idea and there was nowhere to put it. So you had to make a sacrifice. You had to decide to lose something that you did a few days ago, or you had to bounce two other tracks together and free up an extra track, you know. So you were forced to make decisions as you went along. So this this gave you a kind of tunnel vision towards what you were doing, um, which in some ways was a very positive thing, you know, because you were forced to use your ingenuity. Um, like when I, the, one of the first times I came to New York as a professional musician, I was working with Foreigner uh, on the Foreigner 4 album uh, right down the road here at Electric Ladyland. And um, they were already late with their deadline. And they had this ballad waiting for a girl like you, which was mainly sort of Fender Rhodes, guitar, bass and drums and a, and a great vocal. And they wanted to put something spacier on it, you know. And so, but they were already behind, so they just left me alone at night with a relief engineer, and they come back in the morning and they said, right, you got five tracks, you know, do what you can. So, and, you know, so the intro to Waiting for a Girl Like You was a monophonic uh, Moog synthesizer, pl plays one note at a time. But using those five tracks, I was able to weave this sort of network of these floaty sounds coming in and out for that intro. And, um, you know, it's, it ended up being a very iconic intro and especially given AOR radio you know the sort of the rock sound of you know middle America in those days it was quite subversive to have this kind of Eno-esque you know ambient start to a you know to a, a, a pop ballad but um, in retrospect if I'd had unlim unlimited tracks you know unlimited voices I'm not sure if I could have pulled that off you know I think it was partly because you're forced to funnel your efforts into a small space that it forces you to really pull out all the stops was also really the time of synth pop and I really don't like the classification that you are under synth pop because your music is so much different than that but your other contemporaries like Howard Jones 
And there was also at a time, 1984, 83, Herbie Hancock put out an album that had a song called Rocket, which was attributed to the keyboards also. What was going on musically as far as the direction of keyboards? Because it kind of replaced the the hardcore piano and the Fender Rhodes, and it was kind of futuristic. Yeah, it was futuristic at the time. I mean, it was... Um you know, the gu guitar and drum sound still had a pretty strong hold on, on you know, most American radio. Um, but in the clubs, you know, the, the more urban sound, people were experimenting with beats, with drum machines, you know, replacing um, replacing real instruments and things. And uh, the, the sequence synthesized sound, uh, which I guess had started, you know, back in the disco days with like Giorgio Moroder and people like that. Um, it just it just kept evolving and layer upon layer came in. You, had, you know, New Order, who had been known as a, an indie guitar band, you know, and Joy Division before them. But they, they went over to electronics for Blue Monday and stuff like that. And so a lot of the landmark club hits from that period uh, represented a huge breakthrough. Uh, you know, Africa Bambata sampling Kraftwerk and, and, and so on. It was this this continual movement in the direction of electronics, which was so significant. And, you know, the sound that you referred to with, with Herbie, I mean, Herbie had always been an innovator, you know, going back to, like, Chameleon and stuff like that. Uh, but... Um, I think the sound that 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 he nailed there uh, was also reflected in in you know Michael Jackson's albums at the time. So and there you got you know Quincy producing. So it was it was the mainstream the sort of L.A. you know mainstream production producers were starting to embrace that sound and finding ways to layer it with the the sort of rocking guitar and drum sounds of pre previous generations. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report reporting live here at the 92Y Tribeca here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Thomas Dolby for his time, as well as the staff and management here at the 92Y Tribeca. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. Can't try.